Welcome everybody to your seminar today. We're going to talk about how to improve a GMAT score in less than a month, hosted by GMAT Club, run by Manhattan Prep. My name is Reed Arnold. I am a, a GMAT instructor with Manhattan Prep. Happy to be here today. Um, I believe there is a chat box function, so I'm just curious if I could hear from, from y'all where we're chiming in from, where in the world are we? I myself am currently in Colorado, uh, so I'm actually here on a ski trip, taking a time out of my morning to talk with y'all. Happy to be here. Where are you chiming in from? Hi, Afnan. Welcome from India. So it's you know, other side of the world. There we go. Hamat, also India. Fantastic. At these sessions, we often get people from all over the world. It's very fun to, to see. Good. Welcome, Bolu. Also India. Wonderful. Krishnan. Also from India, Manish in Nepal, wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. If you have questions throughout the session, uh, please feel free to type into that chat. I'll keep an eye on it and the answer. Sometimes I might, I might ask you to hold off just for a moment. I might answer it down the road, um, but please feel free to chime in any moment. Um, we're gonna talk today about improving a GMAT score in less than a month. Uh, welcome Aslam, Bangladesh, wonderful. Okay, so we're going to talk about how, how if I have, you know, it's the last month of study, what can I do to maximize my GMAT score in less than a month? So let's say 28 days. I have four weeks to go. What can I do to improve my GMAT score? Now, up front, I want to be clear. I'm not talking today about starting and stopping within a month. Uh, I, I'm assuming that this month is coming after a bit of study already. If it doesn't, if it truly is a month of study or less than a month of study, I suppose many of the tips here still apply. But I just want you to be aware that a month of study is often short for uh, for GMAT scores that most people are going for. Um, unless you're coming in with an unusually high starter score, a month is often not sufficient. So just be aware of that. This is not meant to be a like how to get a 750 with only 28 days of work. Um, most people, myself included, <laughs> will need a lot more time to to get their strategies and content and everything set up proper to get that 750. So just know that when we're talking about improving in less than a month, we're really talking about as if it's the last month after several weeks or months of studying. Okay. Um, Kristen asks, is it okay to focus on only GMAT official questions and the official GMAT prep tests? Um, yeah, I think that's okay. I think that's where most good studies should be focused on official questions made by the official company. Uh, there are plenty of other resources out there. I'll talk about some of the Manhattan preps today, but I think anyone's study should be centered around official materials for what that's worth. Good question. Um, so in that last 28 days, uh, in that last 28 days, I've broken down the uh, improvement process into five basic phases. Okay, so if it's the last push before your test, there's five basic phases to go through. First, you're going to want to identify your weaknesses. You're then going to review the relevant material and practice those weaknesses. Uh, you're going to focus always on habits that prevent careless errors. Okay, that's one of the big things you want to fix in the last month. You're going to talk in the last two weeks. You're going to build a game plan for the official test. And honestly, that last week, you want to take it a little bit easy. You're not going to want to do a lot of cramming. That's not any good for anyone when they're getting ready for this test. Okay, so we'll talk about these five phases uh, and how you can use them to improve your GMAT score. First off, let's talk about what it means to improve a GMAT score. As far as I can tell, there are five ways you get better at the GMAT, right? What does it mean to get a better score? Well, I get harder questions right. Uh, if you're familiar with the scoring algorithm, you'll know it's not really about getting more questions right. If you're not familiar with the scoring algorithm, I encourage you to seek out material to uh, familiarize yourself with the way this test works because it's an unusual game but it's never really about getting more questions right it's about getting harder questions right and not missing easier questions so that's what it means to get a higher score but how does one do that how does one get to a place where they are not missing easier questions and getting harder questions and as far as i can tell there's five places to improve 
First is the concepts, rules, and formulas that the GMAT uses. No doubt that's important. You need to know how sentence structure works. You need to know um, how to get a percent of a number. You need to know distance equals rate times time. All these formulas and rules that the test tests, you want to, you know, you, you want those to be very familiar. But most people find that that ends up not being the thing that really keeps them from getting the score they want. Um, I often tell my classes that, uh, you know, on day one, I can pull up a question right now that uses math and concepts that you are very familiar with, and yet it's still a very hard question. And that's where you want to look at these other places to improve steps, uh, uh, numbers two through four here. You want to look at the mechanics you use to solve a problem. You want to look at the strategies you use to solve problems, the habits uh, that you utilize to prevent silly mistakes mostly. And you want to look at how well you notice inference opportunities, places on the test where you can take a piece of information and therefore know either by logic or quantitative reasoning another piece of information. These are the places that improve. And they're overlapping, to be clear, right? Um, if you pick a strategy, for instance, there didn't have to, you have to go through the mechanics of using that strategy. So uh, you'll have to look at mechanics there. Within a strategy, you'll have to recognize where you can make inferences within that strategy. Uh, so <clears throat> know that they, these are overlapping, but there are, these are the five places. You know, I tell my students to write these on a flashcard, keep it on your, you know, right by you when you're studying and when you're reviewing a problem, run through these five things and see where you can specify how to improve on that question in these five ways, because this is what it means to get better at this test. Um, second, when it comes to computing a score or improving a GMAT score, the first thing to, to keep in mind here is that anytime you take a test, be it an official test or in a practice test, the score you get is, uh, it's a little bit, it's, it's not quite right to call it a guess, but it kind of is a guess, right? It's, it, you represent not a single score on this test. You are a possibility of scores. You are a spectrum of possible scores. Some that are more likely than others. You are a range of possible scores. Okay. Uh, and that's true when you first start studying and it's true when you're done studying. And your goal over time is to raise that range up. Okay. So when you first start off, the harder for you and the easier for you is lower. And as you get better and better, the easier for you goes up and the harder for you goes up and your score goes up. Uh, and then, you know, eventually you might start where you're like a 520 to 600 score. Those are the scores that are most realistic to you. And you shift up to eventually a 560 to 630 score. Then you keep working and eventually you're a 600 to 670 score. Um, so there's always a range of possible scores when you're studying for this test. One single score on one single test does not really encapsulate who you are. And it's very hard to know from one test if you were on the high end of your range or if you were on the low end of your range. Uh, what you're looking to do is just move that range over time such that eventually you get so good that there are just scores that you just pretty much never see again, right? Eventually you get so good that the possibility of getting a 630 is just not going to happen, right? Um, and then you get so good that the odds of getting a 670 is just not going to happen. Meanwhile, your maximum is raising as well. When you start out, the odds of getting a 740, maybe not very high. But as you keep working, eventually you can get 710s and eventually you can get 720s and eventually you can get 740s, right? And so when we talk about maximizing your score in a, in a month, we're going to be talking about two things. Uh, moving the range of scores and then hitting the high end of your possible ranges. Because here is the truth, and this is related to what I said before, it's very hard uh, to study for the GMAT in one month, and within a month or less than a month, it's hard to move much this band of possible scores. We'll talk a little bit about it. You can move it some, no doubt, but especially in the last two weeks, you kind of need to Except that your band of possible scores is where it's going to be. And your job then is to hit the high end of your band. Okay, so keep that in mind as well when you're studying. Uh, that there's two ways to improve a score. To both move the band and to have good habits that hit the higher end of your band. Okay, here's basically a timeline. Uh, so if you're scoring high in GMAT Club test. Uh, there's a possibility we score high on the actual test. I'll be honest, Pooja, I'm not that familiar with GMAT club tests. Um, so I, I, I could not speak to their accuracy in getting a 700, but I know we have representatives from GMAT club here. They will have, I'm sure, some information on, on that question there. 
so in this final month or last four weeks, here's the basic timeline uh, of your study schedule. Okay. And we'll go through the steps here in more detail, but the, on the first day, you're going to take a practice test. We call those a CAT computer adaptive test. And in these first two weeks, this is when you're practicing the important weaknesses that you identify. We'll talk about what it mean, what I mean by important weaknesses, but that's going to be a big, uh, this is the last time where you're really pushing to, to move up your band. After, after these two weeks, you, again, you kind of accept your band is where it is. You're going to take a practice test two weeks away from your official test. After that, you're developing a game plan for your official test. You take another practice test to put that game plan into practice. And then the last week, really, you're going to want to take it easy. You're not going to want to cram. You're not going to do no work here, but you're not going to be cramming. You're not going to be doing a bunch of new question sets or a bunch of practice tests. Okay, you're going to be relaxing and really getting your mind in the right place to take the official test on your test day. This is the rough schedule of your last month. And again, if, if you are one of those people who's just jumping in and like, I only have a month. Um, well, uh, you still kind of stick to the schedule, but just know that imp drastic improvement in a month is pretty tough to do. Okay. Um, I have a question, how to get a, a, a 600 plus? That's a very broad question. Um, I, I can talk a little bit about that at the end, but that'd be, that's, a, that's a very big question to answer. <laughs> Um, how do you know what is your range of scores? Uh, Antonio, that is, that's a good question pertinent to that score range we were just talking about here, right? How do you know your range of scores? I have somewhat an unfortunate answer, Antonio, which is that you don't ever really know it. <laughs> um, it it's, takes too much data. It would take too much. You'd have to spend your whole days testing again and again and again to really figure out exactly what your range of scores are. Um, but you can get a general idea of your range of scores by taking practice tests over time and analyzing the scores you get. So the day you get a new high score, right? If you've never gotten a 700 before, and then one day you get a 700, a 700 is gonna be in your range of possible scores. Um, if you realize, you know what? I haven't gotten below a 600 in the last five or six tests. Well, probably above a 600 is the minimum of your score now. So you can make a best guess based on the practice test that you've done. But I would say practice test is the main place to get that information. Okay. So let's go into the, uh, let's go into the more specifics of these four weeks. Okay. And the five phases of improving your GMAT score in a month. The first thing you're going to want to do at the beginning of this four weeks, these 28 days, this month, however you want to call it, is identify important weaknesses. Okay, and again, I'm gonna emphasize that word important. I'll clarify what that means soon. But you're gonna take a practice test. Day one, take a practice test. And then days two through five, you're gonna review this practice test and other recent questions or recent practice tests thoroughly. You're gonna really find uh, in these practice tests and in these questions you've done recently or other recent practice tests, you want to find what I call important weaknesses. And what I mean by important weaknesses are the things that you know are going to show on the test. There are certain question types, there are certain strategies, there are certain concepts that are just more likely to show up uh, than others. And what you want to do is review these practice tests and these recent questions to find qu easier questions for you easier for you that you missed or took too long on that are in the major GMAT topics or strategies. This is a list of, this is probably is not all of them, but this is a list of many of them. Okay. If you miss a question or take too long on a question because of weakness in some of these categories, if you miss a question where you could have picked your own smart numbers because everything in the question is a percent. If you miss a question in critical reasoning that's easier that asks you to find an assumption. If you miss a, a sentence correction question that's easier that involves sentence structure. Okay, or linear equations, or if you made bad timing decisions, if you made a careless mistake, right? If you lost, kind of lost control and, and got frantic, 
right? If these are why you missed a question that is easier for you, that's on the easy end, and you can use GMAT Club to figure out how hard a question is. You can use our Navigator program. If it's an official guide question, we'll rank questions by difficulty. But you can realize, oh, okay, this question I missed, you know what, it's really hard. I really struggle with it. Okay, that's low priority. This question is a percent word problem. That's GMAT bread and butter, and it's easier. It's on the easier end of the questions I missed. Okay, well, that means that this is probably a weakness I want to shore up for my last month because it's just guaranteed to show up. Okay. I see a lot of questions in the question chat. Uh, I think I'm, what I'm gonna have to do is, is spend time at the end to answer those questions. I think it's gonna be a little bit too disruptive to jump back and forth for uh, gang. So uh, I'd probably save your questions for, for the end. We'll have a question and answer session. Okay, but I'm, I'll go through the slides here first. If it's a question that's really relevant to the moment here, please jump in and ask. Uh, but for these more broader questions, how many tests should I take? What should I expect? Those, those we can save for uh, the question and answer session at the end here. <clears throat> now, when you are looking for weaknesses, you're not looking for every single one of these. For one, you probably don't have a weakness in every single one of these. You might be really good at linear equations and algebraic translations, uh, but you might struggle with a testing cases problem or a sentence structure problem or a main idea question in reading comp. You want to find the ones on this list that you struggled with on easier questions. Okay. Yep. There we go. That's that point there. Okay. So that's phase one. That's the first five days of your, uh, of your last month is identifying important weaknesses on practice tests and recent materials. Okay. Then you're going to spend six, uh, about 10 days, okay, reviewing relevant material on those subjects. So you're going to look at uh, books, GMAT books, like Manhattan Print Manuals. You can look at videos, uh, blog posts, message boards. You recognize that I have a weakness. I missed an easier question in this topic. I want to practice that and get it shored up. So you're going to find the material that's uh, going to help you. And there's many things out there. There's the official guide, Private tutoring, if you want to hire a private tutor in that in those last weeks. Uh, Manhattan Prep has manuals in foundations and general quant and verbal. Uh, we also have the Interact course. Uh, there's our Navigator, which uh, it gives official guide explanations and difficulty. Um, oh, the slide is kind of covering this up, but we have free foundations of math seminars twice a month. If you struggled with some math foundations, you can check those out. We also have on our video, on our uh, YouTube page, what we call free GMAT prep hours. You can seek out the topics. I can almost guarantee you that the topic you struggle on, we have a video on it at this point. We have covered so much of the big stuff on those free prep hours. You can find material for that thing you need to improve in this last last push. Okay. There are also input message boards and blog ar archives. And of course, there's the GMAT club forums full of teachers and good advice and other studiers who can help you uh, improve those things you need to improve on. Okay. And this right here, this is your last major push to improve your score. This is your last push to move that band of possible scores up. We're going to shore up our weaknesses. We're going to deepen our understanding of these concepts and strategies, and we're going to move our band up in these last two weeks. And after that, uh, the slides have mixed up the format in the shift to PowerPoint. I apologize. That's supposed to circle number three. Um, we're going to focus on habits that prevent careless errors. And this is true throughout the whole month. This is true during the first two weeks, and it's especially true during the last two weeks. Okay, we want to avoid mistakes on questions that we are fully capable of getting. That's the biggest goal uh, in these in this whole month, really, but especially in the last two weeks. Your score gets really hit by lower level misses. High level questions that you get right are great. You know, get them if you can. But just know that the thing that really weighs a score down is missing questions that are easier. Okay, that's the that's the big thing that will put a put an anchor on your score and just pull it downward. 
So some of the common careless mistakes I see, one of the first one is just check your timing. You want to get your timing right in these in these last four weeks. Uh, you can do question sets, you know, pick a, 10 questions and set a set a clock that gets the GMAT pace and get through that set as if it's a section of the test. You want your timing to be right. You don't want it to be too slow and you don't want to be you don't want to be too fast. If you leave six minutes on the clock at the end of the section, you probably rushed a little bit. You probably could have slowed down and thought a little bit more. But if you don't even get to the last three questions, you probably went too slow. Okay, you want to get your timing right. And one of the biggest hitches in this game is spending too long on questions that you actually miss. That's just not worth the time. Okay. Other common mistakes, getting the right answer to the wrong question. That happens a lot. Okay. Especially in quant, but you can see it in something like reading comp as well, or uh, uh, critical reasoning, right? If it's a strength in question, you might've answered a weakener. You might've answered something that weakens the argument. Okay, so you don't want to be getting the right answer to the wrong question. Uh, misreading or misinterpreting what the sentence, what a sentence or a passage says, just twisting the meaning a little bit. That's a big mistake that can uh, cost you points. Just the mechanics of arithmetic and algebra. Always look at those minus signs. The lot, you know, losing track of a minus sign. That's that's one of the the most common careless mistakes I see. Uh, mistranslations from English to math, going sentence correction by what sounds good or sounds bad, being a little imprecise on what CR and RC, that's similar to misreading or misinterpreting, but just being a little imprecise and that shifts what you're thinking about a little bit too much. Testing cases logic, very common to see mistakes there. Okay. There are other careless mistakes to be clear, but uh, these are some common ones, and you want to identify what careless errors you tend to make and what can I do to fix them? What can I practice? What habit can I instill, right? If you keep answering the right answer to the wrong question, then before you move on from that question, you need to double check what is asked. If you're not writing down and circling in a math problem, I'm looking for this value. You need to build that habit. And another thing about careless errors, something to keep in mind about careless errors, is that it might not be something that affects you most of the time. You know, you might not usually make an arithmetic mistake. It might only be one out of 20 times, one out of 50 times, whatever. But the truth is, is that's more than you want. You, you have to build habits to uh, fix careless errors, even when they're not common. But if they happen enough, it's a problem. And you'll never fully get rid of them. You know, everyone still makes some arithmetic mistake sometime. But you have to get good habits and double check in the moment, whatever it is, to minimize careless errors on the actual test. Even if usually you don't make them, right? Even if usually you don't make them, uh, a good habit will catch it when you do. And that will save you points. Okay, our red circle has really shifted downward in the formatting change. That red circle is supposed to be on number four here, build a game plan. Um, so that is the careless error phase. Now we're in the last two weeks, okay? And this is really when you acknowledge that your band of possible scores is where it's going to be. It's going to be very hard to shift that band up in two weeks and it's not realistic. Uh, it's not realistic to try. So what we're going to do in these last two weeks is come up with a game plan and really, again, hone in our habits to hit the high end of our possible scores. The basic timeline here is we're going to take a test two weeks away from your final test. And then, by the way, this is rough, right? If it's a day or two before or after, that's fine. But basically, two weeks before your final test, you take a practice test. And you try to make it as official as possible. And this is when you acknowledge your strengths and your weaknesses are what they are going to be. Your focus these two last weeks are on your low hanging fruit, mostly careless errors and timing habits. These are the things you're going to want to really hone in. You're going to develop a game plan this week. And if your practice score is not where you want it to be, uh, you have two options. And by the way, remember, it doesn't have to be the exact number because it's a best guess. But if your practice score is 100 points lower from what you want, 50 points lower from what you want, you know, it's, it's just kind of. Uh, 
tough to say that you could jump 50 points in two weeks. Now, maybe, maybe that 50 points is actually the low end of your range. And so you're really 30 points higher. And then maybe you could get that extra 20 points. It's possible, but just know that that's unlikely. You know, if you're within 10 points, you're fine. If you're within 20 points, you're probably fine. 30 points getting a little, little far away. Uh, but as long as you're roughly close to your, your goal score, you're good to go. If you're not, um, you have a few options. One is to postpone the test, take it to uh, just push it back. The other option is to take the test with a lower goal score. Okay, just go in, take the test with a lower goal score, try to execute as well, you know, do as best as you can, practice taking the test, treat it like a really official practice test. And um, maybe you'll surprise yourself. I've seen it happen for sure. Maybe you'll, oh my gosh, I jumped, you know, 70 points from my last practice test. That does happen, but just know that that's exceedingly unusual. And when it does happen, it's a pleasant surprise. It doesn't come from two weeks of like stress and cramming. That's not going to, that's not going to make it happen. What makes it happen is going in nice and relaxed. You're treating like a practice test. You're going to do your best, you know, just see what it's like to take the test on an official swing, see what happens. And then, oh, surprise, right? But don't cram. You do not want to cram. In this third of your final or your first of your final two weeks, you're coming up with a game plan. You're acknowledging you are who you are and you're not going to move your content skills that much. You're not going to like combinatorics is a common thing. Students come to us for help. Like I really struggle with combinatorics. Yeah, everyone does. They're really hard. You know, it's like and if you if it's your last two weeks and you're struggling with combinatorics, now's not the time to try to learn them. That's not going to improve much. Your strengths and your weaknesses are what they are. You want to come up with a game plan that allows your strengths to shine and allows your weaknesses to have minimal impact on your actual score. Okay. And what that means, the way you minimize the effect of your weaknesses is that you don't over invest in them on the test. If a question pops up and it's a topic you've identified as something you're weak on, I'm not saying you skip it immediately, you poke at it, you might, you know, see what you can figure out. But if it doesn't unveil, you know, if it doesn't start to unveil itself with a little bit of work, if it still seems confusing a minute in, and it's a topic you're weak on, don't waste time on it, get out, skip it, burn it, you're going to have to do that no matter what. Okay, we'll talk about that in the last section here. But you want to just know what to expect when you go into this test. And skipping questions is definitely going to happen. Put your attention on those common topics and look at your decision making. When do you make good decisions? When do you make bad decisions? What questions do you over invest on that don't pay you returns? What questions do you tend to get right when you poke at them a little bit? You know, questions that, yeah, they, they're hard, but if I work on them, I tend to get these ones right. These ones I tend to miss, right? Work rate time questions. If I, if I go long on those, I don't tend to get them right. But even odd questions, I tend, those tend to open up. I tend to get those, right? Figure out where your strengths and weaknesses lie. If you're, you know, if you want to go through like the chapters of the Manhattan Prep Manual, that will lay out the major topics. And you can just say, okay, this topic I feel good on, this topic I feel bad on, this strategy I love, this strategy I hate, whatever it is. Start getting a sense of that. Look at your timing, okay? How good, how, how good a sense do you have of the time spent on a question? Do you get sucked in and you realize, oh my gosh, five minutes have passed. That's not what you want. You want to have a sense of like, okay, that's been about a minute and a half. Probably should start guessing because this isn't feeling great. Or that's a minute and a half, but I feel pretty good about this one. I'm going to keep working. I think, I think it's starting to unlock. Look at your timing. Okay. In these last two weeks, you're not trying to fix major weaknesses. You're not taking a bunch of practice tests to, you know, get the score you want. You don't really improve by taking practice tests, by the way. You improve by reviewing them thoroughly. And if you're taking one a day or one, three, or three a week, it's just you're not really reviewing enough to actually be shifting your range of possible scores. You'll have a better sense of what your range is, but uh, you're not going to shift it by taking a bunch of practice tests. You want to, again, focus on habits. <clears throat> Excuse me, focus on habits that are going to minimize careless mistakes. Look at old content, those old tests, old practice sets. 
Okay. And especially those low hanging fruits, keep looking at those and remind yourself what you learn from them. Focus on your processes, what you do when you notice certain things on the test. When I see a question that only has percents, I choose my own numbers that fit those values. That's just a stimulus response. And yeah, don't totally cloister yourself. You need to have fun. You need to exercise. It's good for brains. Socialize, also good for brains. Studying in the dark for the GMAT 24 hours a day, not so good for brains. So make sure you're not doing that. Okay. Again, know what your strengths and weaknesses are. Where, When are you going to spend time? Where are you going to spend time? What are you going to do if you fall a little bit behind? What are you going to do if you're a little bit ahead? What que- If you're behind, what kind of questions do you want to burn to catch up? If you're ahead, what kind of questions do you want to slow down on? Because you think you can get it right if you go a little long. Okay. Think about those as investments. Where do you want to invest your time and energy on the actual tests? So you come up with a game plan. And then you're going to take one final practice test where you implement that game plan. You put it to work. Treat it again as official as possible. Okay. And then the question in that last week is, did you stick to your game plan? And again, the formatting has moved this red circle lower and lower than it was in my original slides, but that's supposed to be on take the last week easy. And that's true. You don't want to be cramming a lot of stuff into this last week. This is where you just refine your game plan a little bit based on that last practice test. You're always focusing on careless mistakes. And in fact, this week, that's all you're really focusing on is how am I going to avoid careless errors? What habits are going to make me avoid mistakes that I probably should not make? Start a test day routine. Meaning start waking up at about the same time, do a few problems. At the time, you'll start the sections, eat similar foods. Take a snack when you're going to have the break in the test. Um, When you plan on taking this test, when you go to the test, I highly recommend having a snack of some kind. You want a snack ready. Something that has some sugar and protein, something that will pump you up for that next push. Right. Um, There's many studies that show when you reason, when you think really hard, your blood sugar gets eaten up because brains are just batteries. They just devour sugar. And the more sugar your blood sugar drops, actually, the worse your reasoning gets. So you want a snack during this time to get your blood sugar back up. Know what that snack's going to be. Have it ready. Start eating that snack during this week. Okay. You want to develop a GMAT mindset, right? Really focus on how you are thinking and feeling about this test. What do you know about the way the test, how the test works and how the grading algorithm operates, right? I ask you, how do you feel about the prospect of missing a question on this test? How many do you hope to miss? The answer to that question, how many do you hope to miss, can't be zero. It can't be. It's unrealistic. It's it's not going to happen. You're not going to miss zero. I, I mean, if you are, come work for us because <laughs> we'd love to have an 800 score on the team. Um, but almost no one misses zero. Uh, and in fact, you should plan to miss about 25% of the questions, 25 to 40%. You can get great scores doing that. I promise you. So you need to develop a mindset that's really okay with missing questions and skipping questions and not letting a single question spin you into not so much that you get frustrated so much, you know, it's easy to, to go from that, like, oh my God, I'm missing this question. Oh my gosh, I'm going to do so bad on this test. Oh my gosh, I'm failing. Oh my gosh, I'm never going to succeed in life. You have to stop that immediately, right? You have to get like, okay, I missed this question. Next question, right? Get that mindset there because I promise you it's better for your overall score. I always think it's helpful to ask like how much like this test that you're taking today, how important is it to your life? Really, this actual, not the GMAT as a, in general, um, although that's a worthy question as well, to be fair. But I mean the specific test you're about to take. What's the worst that can happen? You get a bad score. You cancel it. No one knows you got it. And you can take it again. You can take the GMAT five times in a year, eight times in a lifetime. 
if this is your first, second, third, fourth time to take it, you still have three, four, five, you have plenty of attempts left. And no one needs to know you took this test, <laughs> right? So like, what's really the worst that's gonna happen when you go in to take the test? Try to take that stress off on this week. Don't, again, don't cram, don't panic, don't get all antsy about it. Take the, you, you've practiced, you got your skills where they are, shed, the, shed that fear, get your mind in a good place about it. That's also part of the game plan, right? What are you going to do when you're behind? What are you going to do in your head? What are you going to do when a question starts to feel difficult? What are you going to think when that fear pops up? What's your response going to be? You want to know that ahead of time. Okay. The worst thing you can do, this is true about this whole month long period, by the way, the worst thing you can do is try to beat yourself. What I mean by that is by trying to push your score above what it actually is, you're way more likely to fall short of what you can get. Because you're stressed and your timing goes to goes to heck, to use a PG phrase. Uh, your timing is bad. You're stressed. You're antsy. You're nervous. You're not thinking clearly. When you miss, you get frantic because you have so much stress on yourself. That's what you want to avoid this this whole time, but especially this last week. Right? You you want to recognize that you are who you are. Your score is about where it's going to be. Your goal is to get that score by trying to beat that score. Uh, you know, 10 points is doable, right? But like trying to jump 60 points and stressing out about it, it's not going to work. And more likely you're going to drop because you're so stressed. Okay. And when it comes to expectations in this time, right, you need to expect to score, you know, within 30 points of your most recent test. I have some students who go into the official test hoping to score 50 points higher than they've ever scored, ever. And that's just not realistic. That's just not a good expectation. That's not good stress to put on yourself. Don't do it. Go and execute as well as you can. And if you need to take it again, take it again. Now, and again, pleasant surprises happen. Sometimes it happens, but don't plan on it. Okay. So get your head in the right place about this test. Start your routine. Day before, get everything ready. This, the, the IDs you need, the snack you're going to eat. If you're going to a center, those can be kind of cold. Sometimes you get a sweater or a jacket. Do not bring a phone. Do not bring books. Okay. If they see you touch a phone, if they see you pull out a book, they will just cancel your score on the spot. So don't tempt it. You're not going to read the chapter that unlocks that score you want on the way to the center. Rely on a good week's sleep this week. Night before something's going to happen, your neighbor's going to be you know, doing power drills, building furniture with power drills or something really loud. You're, the baby's going to be crying. Who knows? You're not going to sleep well. It's just, that's how it works. So plan on a good week. So like sleep well this week so that that one night doesn't throw you off too much. Okay. When it's the day of, get there early, take your breaks, get your snack, do a little stretching. Okay. Get in the business mindset, do your best. Don't worry about the score. And cheers off on you've worked hard. So that is the, let me go back to the first slide here. That is the basic process for improving your GMAT score in less than a month, 28 days. Again, these first two weeks to recap, this is your big final push. This is when you identify topics and strategies that are very common on this test that you have missed recently or taken a really long time on. So you're going to practice those, get those short up because they're likely to show up. Then in your last two weeks, it's more about developing habits and a mindset that will help you hit the high possible, the high end of your possible scores. You know where you're going to invest time, when you're going to skip, when you're going to stick, you know, stay a little longer. What habits are going to avoid careless errors? And then what mindset do you want going into the final test? Okay. And again, try to take the stress off as much as you can. Ultimately, one test doesn't matter because, again, the worst that happens is you don't get a good score and you cancel it and no one knows you took it. No school needs to know. No one ever knows. That's the worst. So there's really no pressure. Take that off. Um, that is my game.
today. That is how I recommend you improve your GMAT score in a month. I'll stick around now to answer questions. I know there's been some in the chat, so I'll kind of scan through and answer those. But thank you all for coming here. I hope you got a good plan, good game plan set up for that last month. Um, ask questions in the chat and I will answer. So I'm going to go back to previous problems here. Um, yeah, again, that question, how to get a, how to get above a 600, that's very broad. Um, so broad that I really don't know how to answer it. I mean, you, you, you get a 600 by not missing questions at the 500 level. And you, you know the concepts, you have the strategies, habits, mechanics, right? You notice the inference opportunities at the 500 level that get those 500 level questions right. And so how to get a 600, that's a bit too broad a question for me to help you, I think, with any, any specificity in a five minute talk. That would be a whole course worth of material. Uh, we talked about how to know your range of scores. How many mock tests are ideal before writing the official GMAT exam? That's a good question, um, An. Uh, again, there's no magic formula to this. I would hope that a student, you know, one of my students who I've worked with, I would hope they, by the time they take the official test, that they've taken six practice tests over the course of, you know, four to six months. At least. And, you know, if they've done a little more, that's fine. My general advice after kind of a warm up period of, pre you know, and OK, so we're by the way, we're now out of the the topic of today's lesson. We're in like a full study plan setup where it's not just a month, it's several months. Um, I would say the basic idea is you take a practice test early in the process and then you give yourself a little bit of time to just get the GMAT understood. Maybe you don't take another practice test for like six weeks. And then after that point, you take a practice test every two or three weeks. That doesn't mean that in those six weeks, you learn everything you can on the GMAT. You won't. That's not enough time. But you're, you can learn a lot. You can get a lot of the foundations down in those six weeks. So you take one early, then about six weeks later, and then every two or three weeks, you take a practice test. And you review them thoroughly. You find your low-hanging fruit. Um, if I have practice tests 710, 720, 730, 700, 740, those are all very high scores. What can I expect on test days? It's sensible to complete six. I mean, yeah. So your scores range from a 710 to a 740. Um, I, you know, I would expect a 730. 720, 730. Those are kind of your middle scores. Um, there's a set. So yeah, 700 to 740. Seems like you can expect something in the 720, 730 range. Now, maybe you'll jump 30 points and get a 760. You've never gotten below a 700. So if you did, it's probably because of timing or stress got in your way and you you got, you know, your mind panicked and you got it, you got in your own way. So I could, I would expect something above a 700, probably about a 720, 730. And if it's a pleasant surprise, a 740 or above. Uh, do in prep study materials, uh, most suitable to, uh, okay. So this is about in prep study materials in spe uh, specifically. Um, Again, it's a pretty broad question, but is it suitable to achieve scores of 750 and beyond? Yes. Yeah, I've seen I've seen students score above a 750 using our materials for sure. What difference differentiates our prep materials and class structure or do it yourself content from other GMAT companies? Um, again, a very big question. I would say one, I mean, one thing I know Manhattan Prep really tries to do in their classes and, and tutoring uh, is we, are, we, we do not focus on, uh, unlike today, which was a kind of a seminar, and unlike the free, jet prep, free GMAT prep hours, which are often more seminar based, our classes are much, or, or, I'm sorry, much more lecture based. Our classes are much more seminar based, meaning we do a lot of interactive work. We do a lot of questions and answers, a lot of group work. Uh, for most teachers anyway there might be exceptions but um it's a lot of it's a lot of asking you the right questions to get you thinking about the gmat and the problem in the right way so we're very interested in how you think about this test i think if i were to say one of the big differentiators and i'm speaking as someone in prep and i'm i'm not saying that this is the gospel truth i could be wrong but i think that many other companies focus on content of the test 
and I'm not saying that's bad. You have to know the content. And Manhattan Prep has content as well. But I think Manhattan Prep's primary focus and what I would say differentiates, differentiates, differentiates us is that we focus very much on strategy and mindset and how you are thinking and how you are organizing thoughts using the concepts. Um, Because that's ultimately what the test really is. The test is not really, do you know the area of a circle? The test is not really, uh, do you know subject verbs? Do you know that, do you know that a singular subject has a singular verb? You probably know that. The test isn't really testing if you know that. Uh, The test is testing, do you have a certain mindset to pick apart a sentence to find a problem when a singular subject has a plural verb or vice versa? And so we're very much focused on the strategies and mindset aspect of this game that is necessary to get high scores. Uh, How often should we take the six official practice test? I I kind of answered that, Pooja, but I'd say every two or three weeks after your first front load of studying. I've been studying for 400 days. I'm uh, I'm going to give the exam on the 20th. What can I do? Uh, Tejas, I would rewatch, well, the 20th, so that's 12 days. So I would go through what I just talked about for the last two weeks. You're not trying to push your score up much at this point. You're just trying to minimize careless errors and get in the right headspace about this thing. Uh, is it better to skip or hit the uh, hit the question when there's no certainty? Are there negative markings or penalty? Uh, KP, that's a big question about the, kind of the algorithm. I've done a, a one of these at GMAT Club about the scoring algorithm. You might be able to find that on YouTube. Um, if not, there's also a free GMAT prep hour on it, I believe, um, where I go through in detail how the algorithm really works. And I'd encourage you to watch that. It's not really – the test is not really – marking you like there's no penalty for missing questions and there's also no reward for getting questions that's that's kind of true and that's kind of not true what the test is trying to do the test is trying to figure out at what difficulty level you go about 50 percent right that's crass that's not quite accurate but it's close enough so it's trying to figure out at what difficulty level do you get half of the questions right and half of the questions wrong And so when you miss a question, you don't get penalized. It just tells the test, it just gives the test data that you missed a question at that difficulty level. Now, if it's an easier difficulty level, think, oh, well, maybe you're more likely to miss easier questions. And so they'll give you an easier question and see if you get it right or wrong. And if you get it wrong, now the test has two data points. Okay, you've missed two easy questions. So you seem likely to miss easy questions. Let's give you an easier question. And if you miss that, then the test really thinks, okay, we've missed three easy questions in a row. That seems you're pretty likely to miss easy questions. Whereas if you get a question right, it's the opposite. The test says, okay, you got this question right. So there's a chance you get this question right. Let's give you a harder question. Okay, you got that one right. Okay, so it seems like there's a pretty good chance you get this these questions right. Let's give you a harder question. It's all about trying to figure out the probability distribution. Now, you cannot just skip a question. You can't just not answer. You have to guess. And there's a 20% chance you guess right. But the GMAT knows about that 20% chance, and it takes it into consideration. So you just guess and move on. How do you reach the 90th percentile in critical reasoning? Um, well, you, you figure out how GMAT critical reasoning works. There's plenty of material in it. I would recommend our free GMAT prep hours. I would recommend our manuals on critical reasoning. Um, there are definitely patterns. The thing about critical reasoning to know is that it is objective. It seems like it's not, but it is an objective game. You just have to figure out the rules. Uh, I'm scoring 690 to 720 in my mocks. Is there any way to break through the 720 barrier? Um, <clears throat> I would have to know a little bit more about you and, and what your scores look like. For instance, I would like to know if, if your quant and verbal score are balanced or if one of them is much stronger and one of them is weaker. So I would say, focus, you know, build up your weaker score. Um, I would need to know what subjects you're missing, though, like what topics you're missing. I would all I mean, my answer to any question about how to improve scores is find the easiest questions you miss and figure out how to not miss those. And that will improve your score. That's always how you improve a score is to look at the easiest questions you miss and not figure out how to not miss those anymore. That will pull up a score. Um, How should I improve solving reading comp very fast with accuracy? Well, I don't know what you mean by very fast. 
um that's that's subjective to some degree you know if by very fast you mean i want to read the passage in two minutes and answer all three questions in two minutes and answer them all right i don't know how to tell you to do that because i can't do that uh i spend my timing for reading comp is about four and a half minutes for for my, my pass it's about three three and a half minutes to read the passage it's about a minute to answer the first question and it's about a minute each question after that so if that's very fast to you okay how do i do that well one is I, I on that first read i'm really focusing on main ideas and i'm trying to synthesize what the author's getting at i'm not worried about the specific details i know why the details are there but i'm not worried about what they specifically say i'm getting the big high level stuff and then when it comes to questions i'm specifically understanding what the question asks and i'm using the passage to answer it as best i can before looking at the answer choices i want to have a really good idea about what i need the answer choice to do before I choose it. A lot of people do the opposite. A lot of people read the passage in two minutes, they rush through it, then they go to the questions and they read the question and they look at the answers. They don't even think about it. They're just trying to pick a sentence that kind of looks like something they read in the passage and that kind of that kind of strategy is just not going to work. But again, we have checkout, uh, checkout for improvement stuff. Let me see if I can find the slide again. All right, look at these resources. To improve. We have loads of videos on reading comp. There's plenty of GMAT club forum topics on reading comp. Um, you can look at our all the verbal for reading comp. We have a lot of RC tips out there for you. If you're scoring above a 45 in quant, really even if I'd say 47, uh, we have an advanced quant manual as well. And there is an advanced quant official guide, or not just advanced quant, just an advanced problem official guide. So if you're scoring highly here, meaning above a 47 in quant and above a 38 in verbal, you can get the advanced materials and practice there. Now, even when you're doing that, focus on the easier ones. Easier to you. Those are always where you're most, that's where most points can be found. What other questions can I answer, gang? About how to improve in a month or any of these other broader GMAT questions. I know I can't answer all of these fully because it's a big question. You know, I'd need a full 10 hours with you to really work through this stuff, but I'm happy to give high level answers as best I can. Okay, so deep. So you're saying uh, you you have trouble applying concepts in a timed environment, especially in sentence correction. Um, so this the, the best way to get faster is to review thoroughly. You don't get faster just by being faster. You get faster by reviewing questions, whether it's sentence correction or not, thoroughly. And you really look at the strategy someone would use to get through a question in a you know a, a fast. You don't go too fast, but how does someone get through this at a good, accurate, but fast pace, right? What are they doing? What are they noticing? What are they thinking about? Because likely, if you took a long time on a question, here's just a truth about anything. And I'm, it's just kind of blunt, but it's true. If you took a long time on a question and you missed it, you did not notice and you did not think about what someone who got that question right and fast noticed and thought about. You have to figure out, it's, it's a really important thing to study. It's easy to study again for concepts. It's easy to study for like, oh, I see, of course, in that sentence, that subject needs to match that verb. Or, oh, I see why that modifier is wrong in that sentence. That makes sense. That's content. That's content-based study. But if you, if you knew that, if, if you understand, you know, if when you read an explanation, like the phrase that makes sense is almost always like, it's always like, yeah, it does make sense, but that's not the hard part. The hard part is having, figuring it out as you're doing it. It's easy for it to make sense when you're done, when you're reading an explanation, 
what does someone do to find that on the first pass without reading the explanation? What are they noticing in the sentence? That's a bigger question. So you have to put, you have to put just, you have to ask yourself, not just why is this right? And why is this wrong? You have to ask yourself, what does someone do, think, notice, strategize to realize that? So, and that can take 30 minutes to really get through a good review process on a, on a question. You might really struggle, like what, spend 30 minutes to figure out how to do it in one. You know, why did they notice that word? Why did that jump out to them? And when they noticed it, what did it make them think about? And how did that help them make an elimination? I'm speaking now mostly to sentence correction, but similar thoughts for other question types. Should I practice LSAT CRs and RCs? Uh, uh, very cautiously. Um, uh, there is some overlap in LSAT critical reasoning. In the LSAT, it's called logical reasoning, but it's basically critical, same idea. There's some overlap, but there's a lot of differences. The thing, you could practice questions that ask for strengthening and weakening arguments. And you could answer questions that ask about how uh, to explain something we, like how could we explain a discrepancy question or what is a necessary assumption question but the LSAT does all sorts of other things that are not relevant to the GMAT like a sufficient assumption that doesn't show up on the GMAT hardly ever um god what else does the LSAT do it's been a while since I've dug into logical reasoning on the LSAT um but they do a lot that's not exactly relevant so cautiously and reading comp on the LSAT, the passages tend to be much longer. Um, and a little bit different. It's, it's again, it's just like, it's not quite the same game. I would say LSAT passages are good practice just for reading though. Maybe not the questions, but just for reading the passage and mapping a passage. That's pretty good practice. But the questions themselves are a little bit different. Anything else, gang, before we wrap up? All right, gang. Thank you so much for coming. Best of luck in your studies. Let Manhattan Prep know if there's anything we can help you with. We'd be happy to. Thanks, GMAT Club.